So uh, we're going to get started. Welcome. Uh, as you know, this is our Med Ed series. This is the fall series, Darian semester, uh, fall semester 2017. Uh, this series is a, um, it's five, five lectures. Tonight's lecture is titled Hernias, Who Gets Them, Why, and How We Treat Them. Uh, we have three more sessions following this evening. Next week uh, is a, a very interesting topic. I'll read the title, Getting to the Start Line, Getting to the Finish Line, Dealing with Common Intimacy Issues. We have What's New in Atrial Fibrillation the Week After, and the final week is Below the Belt, an Integrative Approach to Abdominal Complaints. So as always, a thank you to the library for hosting us. Uh, this is a collaborative between Darien Library as well as the hospital physician, Stanford Hospital Physician Relations. Uh, we are here from seven to eight, it's my privilege to be the medical director of the series. As many of you know, my name is Josh Herbert. I'm a primary care physician uh, associated with Stanford Hospital. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Will Simmons. Dr. Simmons received his undergraduate degree in economics at Wesleyan University, followed by an additional certificate of pre-med studies at Columbia University. He attended medical school at the University of Chicago Prisker School of Medicine, subsequently completed residency in general surgery, as well as a fellowship in trauma and critical care at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He's board certified by the American Board of Surgery in surgery, as well as surgical critical care. After training at Washington University, Dr. Simmons stayed as an attending physician, working in the section of acute and critical care surgery. He was the co-director of Washington University Hernia Center and focused on complex hernia repairs and abdominal wall reconstructions. Um, after living in the Midwest for 14 years, returned home to Connecticut. His wife and three kids recently moved to Darien. Uh, is now the director for hernia surgery at the Stanford Health Medical Group. His areas of expertise include advanced laparoscopic surgery, robotic surgery, emergency general surgery, trauma, enterocutaneous fistula management, abdominal wall reconstruction, care for the critically ill surgical patient, and burn and wound management. As with most of our speakers, I would say all of our speakers recognize both locally and nationally multiple publications, research in the field of surgery. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wilson. Well, thank you so much for letting me talk today. As, as Josh said, my name is uh, Dr. Will Simmons. Call me Will. And uh, we're gonna keep this informal. So if you have any questions at all throughout the presentation, just um, speak up, okay? We'll interrupt and we'll kind of hopefully clarify any issues that, that come about. I have a couple of gross pictures in here, but I figured that would kind of spice it up. So if it's too gross, let me know. As my, as my daughter always says, Dad, why do you like roasting so much? Not as bad as yesterday. Oh, yesterday was bad? At the Bruce Museum, they had a forensic entomologist. Ah. That yeah, was, that was gross. That was gross? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, well, uh, let's see if I can beat that. <laughs> All right, so as, as I said, um, I uh, came here from uh, WashU. I did, I ran their uh, hernia center, and um, basically the kids were getting older. My wife grew up in Waterbury. I grew up in Old Mine, Connecticut, and the thought was just to be, come back home, be closer to the grandparents, and uh, that was one of the big draws that drew me back, and then Stanford Hospital, beautiful new building, uh, lots of great colleagues and so it just it was kind of a no-brainer to come back to Connecticut okay um, so that's a little about me and uh, today what we're going to talk about so we're going to talk about well what is a hernia okay how does it happen who gets them why do they get them what are the surgical options available to us and what are the non-surgical options available to us and then what's the recovery process like if someone does end up going ahead and having hernia surgery, okay? All right, so what is a hernia? So basically a hernia is a hole. So we're made of fascia, um, and overlying the fascia is muscle. And whenever there's fascia that's not covered by muscle, that's an area of weakness of the abdominal wall. And anywhere that happens, we can get a protrusion of 
are interabdominal contents because there's a tear or a hole in the fascia. Okay? The reason we really worry about this is because what can protrude through but a piece of bowel, and then that bowel's blood supply can get cut off, and if it does, then it can be an urgent or emergent issue that need to be dealt with. Okay? All right. Everyone with me so far? Yeah. All right, great. So, again, where do, where do hernias occur? So, anywhere where there's fascia that's not covered by muscle. So, if you think about your six-pack muscle on either side, or varying degrees of our six-pack muscle on either side, then in the middle, there's no muscle. So, there's fascia with just skin and fat overlying it. So, this is all areas of weakness. Other areas of weakness is anywhere anything passes through the fascia. So, at our umbilicus, we're connected to our our moms before birth and the umbilical artery and vein go through that area and so it's an area of weakness in addition it's in the middle so it's not covered by muscle so there's a double area of weakness so that's a common place for people to get hernias down in the groin is a common area to get hernias because there's areas that do not have muscle overlying fashion and things have to pass through the groin before birth like the testicles okay and here's a picture of an inguinal hernia. So it's groin hernia, and there's bowel here passing down towards, towards the scrotum. And that can cause a painful bulge, but, and then the bulge is worse with any type of strenuous activity because more stuff is getting pushed through that little hole. And the concern is that a piece of bowel might get cut off. The blood supply would get cut off. Okay? So usually the way I think about hernias, I kind of break them up into abdominal and groin hernias and then all other hernias. So I kind of break them up into three kind of classifications. All right, so why do we get it? Well, frequent heavy lifting, prior abdominal surgery. So anytime anything's cut into, it's just not gonna be as good and then not as strong. And so even though the surgeon sutures up that fascia when it cuts through the abdominal wall, that area is not as strong as it was before the surgery. And so that can lead to our hernia formation as, as the area breaks down. Chronic coughing. So it's increased intra-abdominal pressure uh, with chronic coughing. And these are, these are sudden increases in intra-abdominal pressure. And that can cause extra strain and areas of weakness can cause a hernia. And then um, other things like uh, pregnancy, where they have a rapid weight gain and then a rapid weight loss. Even though the body is producing hormones to regulate fascial compliance, it's not perfect and people can develop hernias. Okay, so how do we diagnose these? So good news is most hernias, because it's a hole, is a relatively simple diagnostic issue, right? You go see your doctor, your doctor does a physical exam and he can feel the fascial defect or the hole. And so that's usually enough to say, okay, you have a hernia or you don't have a hernia. Occasionally, things are a little bit more complicated. And if they are an ultrasound disorder, uh, which is good test because it's quick, it's easy, it doesn't give you any additional radiation, but it doesn't give you all of the information that sometimes you need. And so then if more information is needed, a CT scan or even an MRI can be performed which gives us a little bit more information, but it's getting a little bit more invasive a test. Yeah? Will that happen without pain? What's that? The, the hernia pushing through. Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, the, uh, the initial. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And so hernias, hernias kind of present in lots of different ways. Some could be very, very painful. Other people have a very slow-growing hernia that actually doesn't hurt them all that much. And so, you know, people present with their hernias different. Okay? So, anyone recognize this guy? Yeah, Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee, right? And so Bruce Lee, um, he, was, he was a master of martial arts and he realized that really the core is the most important thing. And so most of these martial arts guys will spend most of their time really working out their core musculature because it's the key to being strong and healthy. And so the more the, the core can be intact and strong, the easier it is to function. Because unfortunately, there's nothing we can do that doesn't involve our core muscles. Everything involves our core muscles. 
And when you have a problem with your core muscles, you know it because there's nothing, there's no way to not use these muscles. If you break your arm, you can put it in a cast and not move it, but unfortunately, you're always going to have to move your abdominal muscles. And anytime you do, if there's an issue with them, it's going to affect everything in your life. Okay? And so here's just a little schematic. We're going to talk a little about abdominal wall anatomy so that we can kind of understand some basic terms and understand what I'm talking about here. So obviously this is just a person with the outline of their rib cage. Right here is the, their breastbone and the bottom of it called their xiphoid. Here's an outline of where their six pack muscle would be. And this is an outline of where their pelvis is. And so if we were to cut off, oops, sorry, clicker malfunction. If we were to cut off their skin and their subcutaneous fat, and just get down to the first layer here, this is called our anterior fascia, okay? And that's the strong white pearly stuff. So if you're eating a steak, there's that white stuff on the steak that's really hard, that's the fascia. And that actually, that is the strong stuff that holds us together. And then the muscles sit onto that fascia and they help to contract and move our abdominal musculature, but it's the fascia which actually gives it the strength, okay? And so you can see here in the midline, there's fascia without muscle overlying it. And here on the side of the six-pack muscle, this is called, we call this the semilunar line. It's another area of weakness where you can potentially get hernia defects. And then down in the groin, there's the muscle layer of our internal oblique actually forms our, our cremasteric muscles. And so there's an area of weakness down into the groin. So these are all common areas for getting hernias. Okay? Make sense so far? Okay. Good. And then laterally, we just talk real quick, there's three muscles that attach laterally. There's our external oblique, which would be here, and it's cut away. And then there'd be our internal oblique. And then below that is a third muscle layer called our transversalis muscle. And so three muscles laterally, and then one muscle medially are six pack muscles. And those are, that's the, the, those are the muscles that make up the core. Okay, here's, here's a, just a, in, another picture of this showing the same thing. Okay, so inguinal hernias, let's talk about those first. So those are the most common type of hernias. Um, it's estimated that one in four uh, males will have a hernia, an inguinal hernia at some point in their life. It's a pretty common thing. And why is it so common in men? So it's common in women too, but it's more common in men. About a million inguinal hernias are, produced, are done every year. So it's a relatively common operation. And the reason it's so common is just because of how we're born and how we're made. So before men are born, they're living inside the uterus. And at the seventh month of gestation, the testicles, which are sitting next to our kidneys, decide and are ready to descend down through the abdominal wall, pop out through the abdominal wall, and go into our scrotum. And the reason that our testicles go into our scrotum is because the testicles are to make sperm. And sperm needs to be at a lower temperature than the rest of our body. And so, it has, so our testicles have to descend out of our, of our abdomen into a location that can be cooler or warmer. And it's cooler or warmer because this one muscle layer actually goes with the, the testicle and it can help raise or lower the testicle in order to keep it warmer or cooler. But it's also created a little tear in the abdominal wall. And then before we're born, for those last three months, things heal up. So people who are premature infants for example, don't have as long of a time in order for that to heal up. And so premature infants obviously are at an increased risk of inguinal hernias. Those are usually found right at the time of birth, and they're usually taken care of by a pediatric surgeon before that premature infant goes home. Okay, and then, but then with time, and the wear and tear, and the normal strains of life, later in life, that area can open back up, and you can get a hernia down in your groin. Now women, they don't have testicles, I hope that's not a shocker to anyone. <laughs> but they still have their round ligament, which is a suspensory ligament to the uterus. 
So there's still something that goes through that area. It's just not as big and pronounced as a testicle. So women too can get inguinal hernias, but less common than obviously men get inguinal hernias. But even with women, they're still the most common type of hernia. Okay, make sense? Okay, so again, here's a picture of this, this testicle descending down through the abdominal wall, causing an area of weakness here. And if something protrudes through here, it's called a direct, or an, I'm sorry, an indirect inguinal hernia, and if it protrudes through here, it's called a direct inguinal hernia. And then here's just the two pictures of bowel coming down into the groin and into this groin, okay? And here's a picture of what happens if, for some reason, this bowel gets stuck down into this area and doesn't and and the blood supply isn't restored quickly enough. You can see here, this is a picture. We, we're doing an open inguinal hernia repair on someone who's had incarcerated bowel. So this piece of bowel got stuck in here. Unfortunately, the bowel needs a lot of blood flow. So if the bowel doesn't get blood flow after about six hours, it gets very angry and it starts to die. And you know, there's more bacteria in our GI tract yeah. than there are cells in our body. And so it takes a good blood supply to the bowel in order to keep the bacteria where it belongs, inside the lumen of the bowel, and not to spread out through. And so if the blood supply gets cut off because it's getting kinked down in the groin, then that can lead to the bowel dying. And if the bowel dies, then all of that bacteria can spread to the rest of the body. It can make people very sick. So that's usually why we try and not do this kind of an operation, but try and do an elective hernia repair. Okay? Make sense so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions? All right, moving on. All right, so that's not the only type of uh, groin hernia there are, right? Because the other things down in the groin pass through. So you have these big blood vessels, your femoral artery and your femoral vein, and they pass down from your belly down into your leg. Sorry, this clicker is very sensitive. And so where they do pass down into, into here, there's a, this is called your femoral canal. And so this area too, a piece of bowel can get into this area if with time it stretches. And usually when we see this happening is in older females who lose weight. And so initially there was some additional adipose tissue here. And as they lose weight later in life, this area becomes slightly larger and then with some time a piece of bowel or something like that can sneak in there and you can get a little bulge instead of it being at the groin it's kind of on the top of the thigh and this is called a femoral hernia and that's another type of groin hernia more common in females actually than in males okay and then there are other hernias of the groin that are actually more difficult to, to diagnose and we call these obturator hernias because it's through the obturator canal in the pelvis. And because there's muscle layers above it, it's not always felt as a normal bulge. But again, people, if a piece of bowel or something was that was to get stuck in there, there's pain, a lot of pain down in the groin. Sometimes this, these are rare hernias, but they require just a little bit more insight to pick up this kind of a hernia and usually require a CT scan just to help confirm the diagnosis. So this is a CT scan. So the person's feet are coming out of the screen and the person's head is back into the screen and they're cut up like a slice of bread. And so this is just a representative slice down towards the pelvis. And this is the obturator canal. And this little piece here is not over here. It's a little bit of bowel stuck through the obturator canal. Okay, and it's an obturator hernia. Rare hernias, but they do occur, and that's why, you know, occasionally we want more advanced imaging to really understand the hernia. All right, make sense so far? Yeah. All right, so those are the, kind of, those are the major hernias down in the groin. So now we're <coughs> going to talk about kind of the more belly type hernias. Okay? And when we talk about the belly type hernias, we're kind of talking about the epigastric hernias, which basically, epigastric just means around the stomach. It's kind of a very vague term. But usually we mean the ones kind of higher near the breastbone, okay? We're gonna talk about umbilical hernias. Those form around the umbilicus because it's a point of weakness, okay? And we're gonna talk about spigalian hernias, which are along this line here where the edge of the six-pack muscle is. 
and that's called the semilunar line, okay? And where the semilunar line actually meets the arcuate line, which the arcuate line is, a, is, is basically above that, the rectus muscle has a anterior and posterior sheath, and below that it just has an anterior sheath, so not as much fascia. And so where that, and that usually is about two centimeters below the umbilicus, so where that meets the semilunar line, you can get hernias, and those are another rare type of hernias, but not that rare, called spaghetti hernias. That picture of the monitor, how long would it take to get that big? Yeah, so that's a great question. So hernias can develop in lots of different ways. So you can have a small little hernia, and someone can get in a car accident, for example, and have some trauma, and, and it, you can get what we call a traumatic hernia. So it creates a little tear, becomes a very large tear very, very rapidly. That's pretty rare, but it, that is one way that hernias can grow very quickly. Other way, at some point, these hernias can start exponentially growing just on their own. But usually, to get to something like this, it takes time. Okay, this doesn't, nothing like this happens just overnight. 99.9% .9 of the time. Do you have a question? Yeah, on that note, how would you go about fixing it that looks quite serious? So, I mean, what would you do in that situation? Yeah, we're going to get to that. That's a great question. question. Too. Would so, that, that would not yeah. just be the bell. Would that be internal organs and everything coming out? Or? Yeah, so, so depending on how large the hernia gets depends on how much comes out. And so when most of the stuff that's inside you starts to come out and is outside what we call the true abdomen, we call that a loss of domain. Because then there's so much stuff outside and not enough stuff inside to get everything back in, we have to do a couple of special tricks in order to cut some muscle layers. Because remember I said there were three muscle layers on the side? So you can start cutting the muscle layers and allow the layers to slide over each other. It's called a component separation that helps you get everything back inside. So we do have some tricks. So that's a number of different organs there probably, right? Um, most likely in this hernia, it's going to be small and large bowel. And at the very top, there may be a little bit of liver, okay. um, but uh, not actually too many organs in there. Okay. Now, I have done them where you know, you've gotten everything to the point where even the pancreas, yeah. which sits at the very back of your abdomen, protrudes into the hernia defect. Yeah. Obviously, that's a real picture. That's not published. No, no, that's there, a real one. I know. It, it, what did this person think he or she had that they waited so long to go to the doctor? Yeah, so, so there's, there's lots of different reasons that people don't go to the doctor. Um, and, you know, some of them are psychological issues, some of them are fear issues, some of them have to do with other comorbidities, and they're often told that they're not a candidate for a surgical intervention. So there's, there's a whole gamut of reasons why sometimes these hernias can get quite large, quite out of control. Um, and then when, the larger they get and the more complicated they get, the more likely it is that you're going to need someone like me as opposed to just someone who who does smaller hernias kind of a, as, as a routine general surgeon. Okay? Can someone go to you even if they just have a small hernia? Absolutely. Yeah, so, so the majority of people, fortunately, <laughs> which is good, have small hernias. And so small hernias can be, can be treated, and they can be treated quite well with a much more minimally invasive approach. So the larger the hernia is, the more difficult it is to do without actually making larger incisions on people. Okay, but we're getting ahead of ourselves because we're talking about how to fix them yet, and we're not quite there at fixing them. We're still naming them and figuring out why they get them, okay? Yes. All right, but these are great questions, so don't stop, keep asking. That was no good. I broke the clicker. Okay, good. Okay, and so then we talked about epigastric hernias. And epigastric just means around the stomach. And so the stomach usually, come, your esophagus comes down, and your stomach usually sits just to the left of midline. And so just under the breastbone, hernias that come just under the breastbone and happen naturally, that people have given them the term epigastric hernia. Okay? And then there are other hernias that kind of don't really fit into this category, such as diaphragm hernias. Okay? And your diaphragm, so your diaphragm is this long, flat muscle, and it separates your stomach from your chest. Okay? And 
obviously things have to connect between your chest and your stomach. And the biggest thing that connects that really changes in size is your esophagus. So your esophagus is the tube in which food gets traveled from your mouth down into your stomach, right? And as you chew, and some of us don't chew as well as others, and I'm, as a surgeon, I, I usually eat a little fast. One of my cells is complaining that I eat fast. And so I'll take a big bite of food, and maybe I won't chew it as well as I should, and I'll swallow the food, and so it's what we call a big food bolus. And it goes down, and as it reaches the diaphragm, it hits the, the diaphragmatic hiatus, which is just a fancy word for the hole in the, in the diaphragm, where your esophagus connects to your stomach. And so the hiatus has to stretch with the food bolus. And as it stretches with time, this hiatus can get stretched out, and you can get a little hernia of the diaphragm called the hiatal hernia. I had that. I just an ass for this hiatus. But I was told not to do anything with that. Yeah, so, and so that's OK. Um, so there's lots of reasons to fix them, and there's lots of reasons not to fix them, right? And so just because you have this, doesn't necessarily mean you have to fix it. Because with time and swallowing, everyone's hiatus is going to stretch a small amount. So if it's a little tiny hernia, and you're eating and drinking and not regurgitating your food, so the problem is, is as this gets larger, then at first you can have a little bit of your stomach slide up into your chest. And then you can have more of your stomach, and you can actually get other organs to slide up alongside your chest. It can cause shortness of breath. It can cause regurgitation of food. It can cause bad reflux. It can cause chronic aspiration pneumonias as, as the food comes up and then goes into your lungs at nighttime because you're not digesting this food well because it kind of gets trapped alongside your esophagus and never gets to go into the rest of your digestive system. So just because someone said, oh, you have a small hiatal hernia, doesn't necessarily mean you have to fix it. But Oftentimes these things will grow and they'll change, and if that happens, then sometimes we do recommend, well, now you're becoming symptomatic, now it should get fixed. And sometimes people don't become symptomatic, and these grow really slowly, and we can just continue to observe them. Usually the way they're observed is, one, with what your symptoms are, and, and then depending on what your symptomatology is, they can be observed usually with a gastroenterologist <coughs> by putting a scope down. What's that? Kind of what the colonoscopy upper GI is. Yes, so you, so you got an upper GI, and, and then they saw it. And uh, did, did you get an endoscopy at the same time? Yeah. Too? Yeah, and then they do an endoscopy. When they do the endoscopy at the end, at the one part of the endoscopy is to turn the camera around and look and see how much of this stomach is sliding up. And then depending on what your symptoms are, and depending on how much it bothers you, then they, your gastroenterologist would say, well, maybe it's time to go see someone like Will. Okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe say, you know what? You don't need to go see Will. You're okay with that surgery. That's kind of how that works. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So then there are other things that seem like hernias that aren't actually hernias. Okay? So remember we talked about our six-pack muscle here. And with that, especially with things like pregnancy. So with pregnancy, your body produces a lot of hormones. And one of the hormones it produces is to tell your 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 fascia, excuse me, which is that strong stiff stuff, to relax. And as it relaxes, it can stretch and it can accommodate, and it can accommodate the babies, right? But sometimes it doesn't always go back to normal, okay? Especially after multiple births, and this, if you have more than a single gestation with each birth. So sometimes you, this, these rectus still come back into the midline. And this is called the diastasis recti. It looks like a hernia because you get a, this bowing effect, but there's no hole, right? And remember we talked about what a hernia is? A hernia is a hole in the fashion. So, you know, this is a cosmetically sometimes can be quite, quite actually bad, right? If, if, if this diastasis is really large, they can get what we call a functional hernia because their, their rectus muscle goes out to the side and they have difficulty sitting up. They don't have the support in their core as Bruce Lee was telling, works on his core to have it really strong, and so they can get back pain and things like that. So sometimes it can have issues, but most of the time, especially if it's just a small diastasis, it's more of a cosmetic issue. And so these don't always need to get fixed because there's no hole in which a piece of bowel could sneak into and it could cut off the blood supply too. 
but either for cosmetic reasons or if it's really large and causing call, causing what we would call a functional hernia, sometimes we do fix these. Okay, but not always. So a lot of times you'll you'll see a little bulge. People would be concerned, and we tell them, you know, it's just a small diastasis right there. It's okay. Okay. And then there's obviously non-operative things to do for this too. So the more you can hypertrophy these muscles, so working out these rectus muscles, the more you can compensate for that gap. Even though the gap doesn't go away, by hypertrophying the rectus muscles, it can make the, the gap seem small. Okay, we talked about the spigalian hernias, this hernia right at the side here. And here's another CT scan, so a person's cut up, their, their feet are coming out of the, this is a sense of clicker, their feet are coming out and their head is going back in towards the screen. They're cut up like a loaf of bread. And here you can see the rectus muscle, so the six pack muscle. Here are those three muscles on the side, your external, internal, and transversus abdominis muscles. And there's a little tear. See on this side how everything's connected? Here laterally at the semilunar line, here there's a little tear and some bowel has gone outside of the true abdomen, which should be here. Can you show on the, the, the skin line where it would be exactly? Be right here, so it's where the semilunar yeah. line meets the arcuate line. Right here is where those occur. It would be, so it's not as low as an inguinal. Exactly, it's not as low as an inguinal hernia. So it would be up higher than an inguinal hernia, and that would be called a spigalia Okay? All right. And then, and then, obviously, anywhere where you have an incision, right? So anywhere you, where you're cut by another surgeon, you can develop a hernia. So it can be in the midline, it can be wherever, wherever an incision is made, that area is weakened. And the fascia, even though it's sutured back together, is never quite as strong. And so the strain and um, movement, that area can open back up. If postoperatively people get wound infections, they're more likely to get a hernia afterwards. And so all of those things can lead to incisional hernias. And incisional hernias can be quite small to quite large and uh, you know, repaired for the same reason, because these are holes in the fascia, things protrude through. It, you lose the functionality of your abdominal wall and you also risk bowel getting trapped in there. Okay? All right, so what are your options? Let's say you have one of these hernias. What can I do? Well, sometimes, as you said, you have a small hernia and it doesn't hurt. And depending on where you are in your life and what's going on in your life, maybe just watching it and waiting is the right answer, okay? Maybe the answer is to wear a belt because you've got other medical problems going on and it's not appropriate for you to have surgery. But the vast majority of the time, these are what we would call low risk to moderate risk surgery. And mo low to moderate risk surgery in a moderate to healthy person who usually would recommend a surgical repair because hernias don't fix themselves and they just slowly get larger with time. Do and they slowly get larger? Yes. And then, and then as they slowly get larger, then the repair gets more complex. Okay? All right. So here's, here's a belt. Here's just an idea. So the whole idea is to keep pressure on this area. So you know, there's outward pressure coming from your abdomen pushing the hernia out. So if you exert inward pressure by wearing some kind of belt, you can potentially keep things in the right location and cause less pain with strenuous activity and prevent the hernias from getting bigger sooner. Yeah? Is there any possibility of your fascia repairing itself or is it? No, unfortunately not. So unfortunately with time, the, the hernias just get larger. They don't, they don't ever repair themselves. Okay, and then there's the operative approaches, okay? And so there's the old-fashioned open incision. So here's one for a groin hernia. So we make an incision here, usually just above the inguinal ligament. So the inguinal ligament is a line that connects your pubic tubercle to your anterior superior iliac spine. And we make an incision, usually about a finger or two finger breasts above that, cut down through the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and here's that white fascia being opened of the external or of the external oblique to to identify the hernia defect which is going down into the groin. And once we do that, 
we repair the defect, and we put a piece of mesh in to reinforce the repair. Now, fortunately, most people don't actually need this surgery, but most of the time, we can do these repairs either straight laparoscopically, so laparoscope is, is a little instrument which has a camera on it, and we use straight instruments that look like little chopsticks, and we go in there with the camera, instruments that look like chopsticks, fix the hernia defect and put a piece of mesh in from, from that with three little incisions. And then even more recently, we use robotic surgery. So instead of using just strict chopsticks, now we have instruments that can actually articulate and we can use our wrists again. So <clears throat> more minimally invasive options to take care of hernias. Okay, and here's a look at a, a hernia. Instead of from the old fashioned open way, with a laparoscopic view. So this is this is the you're you're now inside the abdomen, looking at the pelvic floor, and so here is your inguinal brain. Here's a little hole in your in your uh, fascia right here where things are protruding through. So this needs to be repaired. Sorry, this needs to be repaired, and a piece of mesh is used to cover the direct, indirect, and femoral spaces. And here it is again, just showing the pictures from looking at the inside. So this is the six pack muscle attaching down here to the pelvis. Here are those big arteries and veins that are gonna run down into the legs. And this is, this is a piece of mesh that's used to cover these holes, which are the common areas where you get groin hernias. Okay. And so here's another picture of a hole. Here's the hernia defect. And here it is after it's gotten repaired with a piece of mesh and usually with three little incisions to help close it up. Questions so far? Yes, sir. There's a whole branch of the law, the law uh, firms that are dedicated to suing uh, the, 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 the uh, mesh companies. Absolutely. In particular, you do a Johnson & Johnson Physio mesh. Yes. Uh, can you come up, comment on that? Yes. Yeah, so be a problem with mesh. Yes. Yeah, so, so there's a couple of there's a couple of problems, right? So there's what what happened is there's lots of different mesh out there. There's lots of different types of mesh, and different types of mesh are used for really have different indications. And so, in order to truly do this and to do this well, the surgeon is going to be putting in these meshes has to know the different properties of the different types of mesh and when to use which mesh in which exact location, right? So the mesh you're talking about was a physio mesh. It's off the market now. And the reason it's off the market was because in Europe, they came up with some studies that showed that there was an increased risk of hernia recurrence and of mesh failure, right? And the reason, there was two kind of, two-fold reason that we could kind of predict that there was gonna be an issue with physio mesh. One, it had a barrier coating on both sides of the mesh. And so the reason it had it is in case the surgeon, when he was putting it in, flipped it around by mistake and put it in the wrong way, it didn't matter, right? Because it was coated on both sides. But the problem with that is it didn't grow into the abdominal wall well because it, was, it, was, it had a coating that was trying to prevent it from attaching to the bowel. And so because of that, it was, it was it, it didn't incorporate quickly into the abdominal wall. And you want something that will incorporate quickly so that it can become part of you as quickly as possible. The other problem with the physio mesh is the, the less mesh material you have, so see the holes in between the mesh? So the bigger the holes are in between the mesh, the less you're gonna feel the mesh, right? So what we want is we want a lightweight mesh so that people don't feel it. But if you get it so lightweight, then it won't be quite as strong. And so, you know, it's always a risk and balance between those two. So if you were going to use a piece of physio mesh, you really, you know, most surgeons are kind of understanding the basics of the burst strength of the mesh. And this is kind of getting beyond this lecture topic, but different meshes have different burst strengths. And so they truly understand what you should use and where you should use it. Um, a piece of physio mesh in an 85-year-old a uh, female who doesn't do a lot of strenuous activity probably won't tear. But, in, 
but a piece of physio mesh in a large hernia defect in a 35 year old active construction worker, you, you run a pretty high risk of it tearing, right? So, so you, that also has to play kind of a role into mesh selection. And so that's why you kind of really need someone who's a hernia specialist who can understand some of the more of the nuances because mesh products come out all the time and they're promoted by industry and they have their place but not every not every mesh is the same they have different properties different characteristics and some of them make them good some of them make them bad another another mesh that became a big issue was the kugel mesh so this is a mesh for women right what's that the one you're trying to ask for the women so that's a that's a different pelvic oh, okay. floor suspensory mesh that had some erosion <coughs> issues. Yeah. But even the regular Kugel mesh in for, for abdominal wall mesh had a little plastic ring that went around the side of it. And so it was great because the surgeons could put it in and it would kind of flop open into the right location and be easy to sew in. But the little plastic ring with time would break and would poke into the bowel oh. and it caused a lot of issues. So these are, so, you know, yes, different meshes. These are meshes that are going to be in you forever. Most of the time they cause no problems. But these meshes did have a higher chance of having issues. And so that's one when Are they plastic? Is that what they're made of? Yeah, so, so typically there's two different kinds of mesh. There's a biologic mesh, which is a, an absorbing mesh. And that's usually made of some type of either uh, human or um, animal uh, acellularized dermis. So that's temporary, it eventually absorbs? It eventually absorbs. It's expensive. It eventually absorbs and it has to be acellularized so your body doesn't have an immune reaction to it. And those meshes usually dissolve with time. And so they're not good for long-term repairs. So in an elective setting, we try not to use those types of meshes. We use those types of meshes <coughs> when the fields are dirty and we know we just need some kind of closure and we're gonna come back later and do a definitive surgery later. That's when we use the biologic meshes. And then there's the, what we call the prosthetic meshes. And um, these are the, the permanent meshes, and there's, these are either polyester, right? So um, initially polyester was bad because it was multiple uh, weaves. So instead of it being a single strand, uh, which we call monofilament, it was a weave of polyester. And a weave of polyester, like you can imagine, things can get in between the interstices of the weave, and it has a higher risk of infection. But they've changed the polyester mesh. So sorry. Um, but they've changed the polyester mesh, so now it's a monofilament weave, so it's actually a safer mesh. And then the other types of mesh is polypropylene. And polypropylene comes from a heavyweight to a lightweight mesh, all depending on what you want to use it for and for who do you want to use it and where do you want to use it and what the, what the different kind of strains are on the abdominal wall. So a, her, a, a piece of mesh that's placed over the omelicus has to be stronger than a piece of mesh that's placed down in the groin because there's different forces on the different parts of the abdominal wall. And so that's why you have to understand what kind of mesh you're using and where you're using it for. And when people get into trouble, it's because they don't understand the properties of what they're using and when to use it, okay? Is it difficult to get it back out again if you um, it depends. It depends on the size of the mesh and what the reason is to get it out. But yes, it's, it's usually a bigger operation to take out the mesh than it is initially put it in. Do you ever do repairs without mesh? Uh, yes, occasionally we do repairs without mesh. But there's reasons not to do repairs without mesh. So defects that are larger than two centimeters have a much higher rate of recurrence. So upwards of 40 to 50 percent recurrence rates without mesh. So usually larger defects, we do use a mesh. And we're using mesh if it's used appropriately in the right locations, very safe. Okay, kind of a long-winded answer, but I hope that helps. No, good. All right, so um, here's another hernia defect. So you can see here, this, uh, this is just straight laparoscopic for a incisional hernia. And here's omentum. And the omentum is that fatty apron that sits over your uh, bowels, just kind of help protecting everything. And so there was omentum and actually a little bit of transverse colon that had gone up into this hernia defect. It's pulled down. Here's the hole. And the hole is... Oh, where's the next picture? Oh, oh I'm missing a picture. Uh, anyway, the hole is 
sutured clothes and a piece of mesh that is used to, to repair the herniated defect. Huh. Um, I'm, maybe my slides are a little out of order. Here is a picture. Let's hope this video works. Uh, doesn't look like it's going to work. So here is a grape. Uh, and the skin of the grape has been peeled off. And this is the robot here using yeah. 7 suture to just suture back up the, the grape. So, so the nice thing about instead of just the strain instruments here, which open and close and don't, you can't use your wrists to articulate. You just get a little bit more freedom with the robot in order to articulate and sew a little bit better. So that's really the big advantage to the robot. And here They're it is. They're expensive to use, aren't they, for the patient? No, so, so it should be no difference. The, the patient doesn't get charged a different fee. So, um, you know, usually when you, when you have a surgery, there's what we call a a professional fee and a facility fee, and uh, the insurance company just pay a flat rate um, based on based on the procedure, and uh, then the hospital has to determine whether they want to invest in something like this or not invest in something like this. But the facility the facility fee that goes along with things is set based on um, what the procedure is, not how the procedure is done. If it's yeah. done straight laparoscopically or robotic. Read that the, the robotic is not as good an outcome statistically as you doing it yourself. Is that true? Um, it depends what you're talking about and for what. But uh, no, usually that's not true. Uh, so, so most of the results, because it's still someone like me sitting at a console doing it, and it just gives you a little bit more articulation and freedom. But again, you have to be trained up and know what yes. you're doing. Otherwise, otherwise, yes, any tool. He's only as good as the person that's using it. Okay? And here's here's that, oh, it was just out earlier. Here's that fascial defect closed up and a piece of mesh that goes in. And so this is a mesh, this mesh is actually going intraperitoneally. So depending on where the mesh is, we try, I try, to do as little mesh intraperitoneally as possible because this means that the mesh is under here is bowel. So bowel can stick to this mesh. So this can, type of can you say absolutely, and so this type of mesh has to have a coating, and the coating slowly dissolves as the mesh incorporates. Now the problem with the physio mesh was it had a coating. Oops, sorry, it had a coating on both sides, yeah. and just in case the the surgeon flipped it over by mistake, right? But again, you don't really want that because you want it to incorporate into the abdominal yeah. wall, so that and as it incorporates into the abdominal wall with time. Then it'll be less. This isn't a person. This what are the little black dots? Yeah, the dots? yeah, so that's a great question. So these are tacks used to help hold the mesh in place. Tacks? Tacks. And that plastic can stay in your whole life? Yeah, so, so what happens is it, once it becomes epithelialized, <coughs> so your body basically incorporates it in. And so a layer of you will cover it up. Yeah, and so that, that usually happens within a couple of weeks. Right? And, and, and your body does that with all types of things. So, yeah. you know, when you hear about stents, like stents in your heart, right? Yeah. right? They, they, what we do is, the stents in your heart, they actually elute chemotherapy agents, killing agents, so that, so that your cells don't grow around the stent and occlude the stent. But in this situation, we wouldn't want that at all. We want the exact opposite to happen. We want your body to kind of epithelialize it as quickly as possible. And it doesn't hurt you, that plastic being in you, it doesn't hurt you. No, it's an inert plastic. So um, uh, polypropylene is an inert plastic. And as long as it gets incorporated, then it won't adhere to the bowel. And so if you do place the intraperitoneal, you need a coated mesh so that it stays coated and doesn't, and doesn't adhere to the bowel until it gets incorporated. Good. Yeah. Would that be similar to a, like a combat situation where you have an explosion and shrapnel goes in you? and the body kind of grows around it and you don't feel anything? Yeah, so yes and no. So so usually usually shrapnel that goes into someone, as long as it's as long as it's superheated before it goes into you, like a, a, a projectile coming out of a, a gun um, that's that's superheated, it's actually it it sterilizes itself as it goes it, as it goes out of out of the barrel of the gun. And so usually the only reason that 
bullet wounds or wounds from shrapnel will get infected is because when it enters into the person, it will take a piece of fabric from their clothing, and their clothing isn't sterilized yes. like the high-powered projectiles. Yes. So if you're going to get shot, it's better to get shot without a shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get shot. How about that? Um, but uh, so so yes. Yeah, so but the, the difference there is that what's happening with the piece of shrapnel is your body is encapsulating. So what's happening is your body is basically making a bunch of fibroblasts to kind of come around the whole thing so that it's completely cut off. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to, de and that's the reason there are these little spaces in between the mesh, is we wanted to incorporate between it, not just encapsulate it. Because if you encapsulate it, then it's just going to be hard and it's going to shrink and cause shrinkage of the mesh. And when you get shrinkage of the mesh, then you're going to more likely to get a recurrence either above or below or the sides of the mesh. So we wanted to incorporate, not encapsulate. But it's okay for the tags to stay? So, um, no, it's not. And so, um, so what, we've, what, what we've done is now, so this is, these are titanium tags. So these stay in you forever. So if you need a piece of titanium, it's okay to have titanium in you. But it would be better not to have titanium in you if you didn't need to, right? Titanium is pretty inner uh, metal and usually doesn't interact all that much. But what would be even better is to have no tacks in you. And so we've changed from using metal uh, tacks to using plastic that's a slowly dissolving. So as this finishes incorporating, the tacks dissolve out. Well, that's good because you go through the metal detector at the airport. Oh, it's just not, not enough to take off. Yeah, yeah, it's not enough to take off. Do these Go tanks ahead. take the place of sutures? Is that what's... What, is that uh, so that's a great question, and that's kind of still, I would say, somewhat debated. And uh, I would say no, they don't completely take the place of sutures. And so you can see that, you know, ideally, you still suture up the defect, and the tanks will help reinforce the repair, and the mesh will help reinforce the repair. But yes, they don't completely take away suture. Okay. And then this is a, this is just, you know, support placements after a uh, incisional hernia repair. So this one had three. This one had a couple more. But usually you're able to get it with three to three to five little stab incisions in order to to fix most most even even moderate to large size hernias. Okay. And so. The laparoscopic and robotic repairs, we were talking about decreased pain, improved post-op recovery, and usually back to full activity by about two weeks in most people. Um, and so the biggest thing with inguinal hernias especially is chronic pain. And we've seen that with open repairs, that chronic pain can be as high as 10%. Mm -hmm. And with a more minimally invasive approach, get those numbers down to less than 2%. Now, what's chronic pain? It's different for everyone. So, you know, it can just be a little burning down in your groin every now and then to people who are taking narcotic pain medicine on a regular basis. And usually if it's that debilitating, that's when we talk about going in and doing what we call a triple neurectomy, so removing those three nerves. So it's better to have no sensation than chronic pain and uh, removing the mesh. But that's pretty rare. You're talking about post-operative pain? Yeah. Pretty rare, and it's even more rare when you do it do the approach laparoscopically. And that's one of the big advantages to doing these laparoscopic. Okay, and then you can basically just get back to normal life quicker. Okay. Now there are some hernias that just we just can't do this kind of a more minimally invasive approach. So this is this is a gentleman who had had a um, a gastric bypass surgery and he had developed a hernia afterwards. And here's one of my residents holding up this hernia defect. So um, he had lost some weight, which was great. But then unfortunately, as happens sometimes after gastric bypass, people learn how to eat kind of around their gastric bypass. And so unfortunately, he gained some weight back. And then in addition to that, he had a large hernia defect. So now, even if we could do this laparoscopically, there'd still be all of this redundant tissue that we wouldn't want to, he wouldn't want to have. So here's what we talked about. Remember your question earlier? I'm sorry, I'm kidding me, but you'd ask a question earlier about well, how, do you, how do you get everything back in, right? And so as the hernias get larger, what we have to talk, think, start thinking about is 
separating these muscle layers. So this is that rectus muscle in the middle. Here's your external oblique. So this is the ones that were kind of going this way, hands in the pocket. Here's your internal oblique and your transverses abdominis muscle. These are three muscle layers that kind of all overlap each other on the sides. And so what you can do is you can separate these muscle layers and allow them to slide over each other. It's called a component separation. And as you do a component separation, you can actually, um, depending on which, geez, depending on which component separation you do, you can release different muscle layers. So, yeah. What would happen to the skin in something like that? Yeah, so how, how do you, so how do you this, deal with the outer skin? Yeah, so this, the skin, after, after everything is repaired, would become ischemic because it wouldn't have the good blood supply, so it would die anyway. So all the more reason why this patient needs an open surgery in order to fix this. But would you remove it? Okay. I'll get you some pictures. We're, we're not there yet. We'll okay. get there. Okay. Okay. All right? Promise. We'll get there. So here you go, Here's, here are these muscle layers. And so the, the release that's actually, the, in my mind, the best, and there's still a little bit of debate over this, but you know we've published on this too, is to do what we call a posterior release. So cutting into this posterior fascia behind the rectus muscle, because the rectus muscle has fascia above it and below it, and then coming over here to buy a semilunar line, and incising and allowing the transversalis to slide laterally so you don't have large tissue flaps and you can get a good release to allow the muscle layers to slide over each other, okay? And that would be kind of explained by this picture. Um, it's, it's kind of a combination of three and six, okay? And that's usually the best, that's usually the best component release. Okay, and here's a picture of it. This is a transversalis release. And so you can see we come in here, cut this fascia, come out here just, so these three muscle layers, especially up near the upper part of the abdomen, your transversalis comes in most medial. And we can cut through this just medial to the, this line here, which is that semilunar line, and open this and allow the muscles to slide over each other. And here's that sliding effect from here to here that we've gotten to allow things to kind of close over. Here's the rectus muscle exposed here. And, and this is the abdomen open. This is down here is their feet, up here is his head. Make sense? Does, yeah. Does this sliding continue throughout your life? Or is this just for no, the abdomen? No, 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 no. The, the sliding, the sliding is, is to allow the abdomen to accommodate all of the contents that were no longer in the abdomen. And then once you get everything back in, we reinforce this with a mesh, and then hopefully we get no more sliding because we want things to kind of stay where they are. Why do you do that, that muscle thing? What's the purpose of it? Yes. To give more room, more room to the abdomen to, to get everything closed. Yeah. Okay, and here's, here's, here's the same technique, and this video doesn't seem like it wants to work either, but doing the same technique robotically so here is the rectus muscle. Here's the rectus muscle here above, and we're coming in and cutting the uh, right here, which is along the transversalis muscle to kind of give it another release. Okay. And so this this gentleman, he wasn't appropriate for any kind of more minimally invasive surgery because, as no. you said, what would you do with all this skin anyway, yeah. even if you were to fix everything? So kind of gets a big release. Here's that release, see that, uh, that added release. Yeah. And then this is it closed afterwards with all of this extra redundant skin cut out and some drains in this just to allow any additional fluid to get drained out. Drains come out after about three to five days and the repair, he has a big piece of mesh. Unfortunately, there's no way around getting a big piece of mesh, but the mesh sits in between the muscle layers away from the bowels and he gets, he got a piece of mesh that was um, 30 by 30 centimeters. <gasps> yep, so basically up to the breastbone, down to the pelvis, mm -hmm. and cover the whole abdominal wall. So because you, you can see wall. here, you can see here that, that a gentleman like this is gonna have a lot of intra-abdominal yeah. pressure, yeah. and so he's gonna need that repair supported. 
and you know we've already cut through muscles laterally in order to slide things forward. And the lower right is after he had the surgery. Yeah, that's it. Done. Yeah. Okay. This yeah. must uh, really increase the time of recuperation. Uh, so um, not really. So this is a big. This is what we would consider a abdominal reconstruction because we've got to move the rectus, which has gone lat very far laterally back into the midline, and um, kind of realign all of the muscles. You do use your core muscles for everything. So uh, he spent uh, four days in the hospital. This isn't one of those patients that can have outpatient surgery. Mm -hmm. Spent four days in the hospital. Um, he did not need to go to a rehab facility, but as patients get older, sometimes they'll go to a rehab facility too for a period of time afterwards to get their strength back. Um, his first train came on on day three, and his last train didn't come on until day seven. But uh, you know, the different people kind of convalesce differently, and it depends. You, you, the physiologic state of the person going into the surgery really determines how well and how long the recovery is going to be. Does that make sense? Wait. <laughs> after the surgery. Oh, well, he, we, that wasn't the point of this surgery, but we did take off, obviously, some, some tissue off of him, yeah. Uh, probably took about six pounds off. In the article you wrote uh, in, from an advertisement from Stanford Hospital describing sure. your uh, primary surgery, uh, you mentioned this period of one week in the hospital for the more complex repairs. Yeah, I would say I would say that's average four to seven days. It's usually what I tell people. And that's yeah. not complex. <laughs> this is complex. Yeah, yeah, this is complex. Four days. Yeah, four to seven days is I, I think a normal thing to tell people. And usually the biggest issue we're waiting for is just the bowels to wake up because yeah. no one can go home until their bowels wake yeah. up. And anytime you open open the abdomen and expose the bowels to air, you go to sleep for a period of time. Normally outpatient. Uh, yeah, the smaller surgeries, yeah, they're all outpatient. Um, so we do, we do them that day. Um, patients go home that usually that evening. Yeah. But again, these are these are the larger, um, larger, bigger, bigger repairs. And then sometimes things just get absolutely. Oh and so you were talking before. Someone asked before about well, you know, what kind of things are in that hernia? And so this guy, he pretty much had everything. Oh, right. Yeah, so his liver was over there behind us. This is a massively dilated transverse colon. This is a fistula with his uh, descending colon. This is his sigmoid colon, which is chronically enlarged here. And he was told he was told by multiple surgeons that he could never have surgery and that he would die if he had surgery. And uh, he was living in a nursing home when he became acutely obstructed to the point where he couldn't do anything, and that's when he came to see me. So even the largest hernias we could fix. But how could he let it get like that? How many years could it be? Uh, he had this for six years. Oh, six years. Why, why yeah. did he let it get like that? He no, went he to doctors, doctors and was told that he couldn't have oh, a repair. He was what? Told he, told he couldn't long. have a repair. Can you finish the what? He was told he could not have a repair, that it would kill him. Because it was too heavy? It, because of a combination of it was too heavy, and his hernia was too complicated. Oh, and look, he's all stitched up. And so, so yes, he didn't get the prettiest repair I've ever done. But you know, we were talking, we we sacrificed here probably about three square feet of skin, and so we had to rearrange the tissues in order to get it closed. So he didn't get the prettiest repair, and he has a kind of an ugly scar, but very happy. How long does it yeah, take to do a surgery? Yeah, uh, so typically, our com so my complex abdominal wall reconstructions usually take about 240 minutes. Is kind of what I average. Um, so you know, it, it, it would all it would all kind of depend. I think uh, this this surgery took uh, four and a half hours. How old was this person? Uh, 66. Wow, Ford seems incredibly good, actually. Yeah. Thanks. I don't dilly-daddle. <laughs> okay, but it just again, this isn't the norm, but um, you know, thankfully, being being the referral center for the entire Midwest, so we got patients from just below Chicago to yeah. just above Memphis to Ohio to um, Kansas, so we have a large catchment area, so we would 
unfortunately see the, that the routine. You came, here you came. Yeah, the routine to the most complicated. So you know, it's a, it's it's nice to have that kind of depth and breadth. And uh, you know, at Stanford Hospital, we've done some very complicated cases too. Not this extreme, but definitely that extreme. Yeah. And the guy in the article that we had talked about, you know, he had a he had a chronic MRSA infection with a chronic open wound and a large hernia that we had taken care of. I don't think they mentioned all that in the article, wow. which is kind of you know, so he had chronic MRSA infection at the wound, but we took care of it in one go. When nice. people are heavy like that, I'm assuming he probably weighs four hundred pounds or so. Uh, he no, he wasn't quite that heavy, no? but he was heavy. But does that tend to happen a lot when people get that heavy? Don't yeah, so 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 think of, if you think about hernias, um, what you're what you're doing is you're increasing as you increase your girth, your abdominal yeah. girth, you're increasing your intra-abdominal pressure, right? Because the force over the diameter is an yeah. exponential increase of uh, force, mm -hmm. and so that you're more likely to generate a hernia. But you know uh, the, that's uh, that's why we're here to take care of everyone. That's a lot to do that. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? All right. Um, regarding the um, hiatal hernia, yeah. What effect would not chewing your food well uh, do? It will having big chunks down there. Like I have Shatsky's ring. Mm -hmm. And I have to chew things almost into a puree yeah. to get them down mm -hmm. easily to where it's not, there's no discomfort. Right. Uh, larger chunks, would that have any effect on that? Well, so, um, oh, it, not in any given day. So if, you, if any given day you don't chew your food as well, probably not. But, you know, if you, if you had a um, propensity to eat without chewing, um, then you, you've got to you've got to dilate your esophagus more, right? And as you dilate your esophagus more, then you stretch your hiatus, so you would have a slightly increased risk. The other things is obviously any kind of intra-abdominal weight gain is going to push up uh, all of the intra-abdominal content <coughs> and put pressure from the inside on the on the hiatus and put you at risk. Is the Shotsky's ring, is that a hernia? Or? No, the Shotsky's okay. ring is, is, a, is a web of tissue yeah. that's usually at the gastroesophageal junction. And um, you, usually that is, that is uh, a result of, of reflux and um, oh, okay. chronic inflammation at the gastroesophageal junction. Okay. And the gastroesophageal junction is that area where the hiatus pinches things closed. Yeah. And so the hiatus acts as a natural valve to keep the acidic content of your stomach down in your stomach and to keep the pH in your esophagus at a normal range. Because okay. the pH of our stomach is somewhere down in the range from two to four, depending on where we are and what we've just eaten. And so we, that had, that's pretty caustic, so it's, it, it, yeah. it, it would erode normal tissue. Mm -hmm. But the reason it doesn't erode the stomach is because the stomach has a, has a lining of mucus, like snot. Yeah. But a thick yeah. layer of snot that is along the folds of the stomach mm -hmm. and a very rich blood supply and between those two things keeps it it keeps the acid from, from hurting the stomach lining. But the other issues if you have if you have an incompetent valve so the hiatus it gets large um, and things reflux through, you can get more inflammation mm -hmm. too. So lots of reasons that you can have reflux and have inflammation. But sometimes that inflammation can cause um, webs of tissue, and that's that's what a shots is okay. right? Oftentimes, that's dealt with, as you said, by chewing and eating smaller smaller boluses of food, and um, controlling the acid from the reflux, and then sometimes dilating up that shots each ring. So putting a dilator through that and breaking up those webs. That's why I find um, ice cream is the uh, the <laughs> choice. <laughs> yes, ice cream is perfect. For that. Eat for lots of different reasons. <laughs> yes. Can, yeah, sure. Can one symptom of an epigastric be with a reasonable amount of exercise, but not sit-ups or anything, just something that uses your core a little bit? Mm -hmm. Burping? Uh, burping uh, up from an epigastric or a hyaluronic? That's a good 
question. Yeah, so so usually usually burping not from an epigastric hernia, because an epigastric hernia is a hernia of the abdominal wall. Um, so it can occasionally, if you're getting things trapped in there, cause some bloating and but cause that with exercise. Yeah. Um, usually usually wouldn't cause burping. Usually not. But a hiatal might? Um, again, a hiatal might cause burping because it's you're having a an inability to digest no, all of your It's food. not exercise, so no, pretty much the answer is no. Pretty much. Huh. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Is everything you do performed at Stanford Hospital, do you have order with you? Are you with a group at another office exterior to the hospital or how is what's your setup like? Oh yeah, sure. So um so I, I uh, work for the Stanford Health Medical Group. And so we're a medical group that's a, a so a group of physicians that's aligned with the hospital. And uh, in my group, I have um, I have six partners. All with different specialties, or you all do the same thing? Uh, all with slightly different specialties, um, but um, four of us in addition also do hernias, not just myself. And are you at the hospital, or are you somewhere else? Uh, no, I'm, I, I, I'm located in a building right next to the hospital called the Medical Office Building. And it's right next to the hospital. They just built a nice shiny that's new building group is. on the sixth floor, and that's where I am. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. Did you sure. design any of these techniques, such as separating the muscles so that they can slide? Some of this your actual initial, initial work? Uh, no, I wouldn't take credit for any of this. Um, so I, um, these are the, the, the posterior release is a relatively new technique, uh, but uh, no, I didn't, I didn't create the, I didn't create it. Any other questions? Is it okay to live with an epigastric if you've figured out how to? Um, so. I would say that if, if, you, if you are resigned never to have surgery, um, that you can live with most, hernia, most hernias without surgery. Um, it, but again, unfortunately, they do just slowly increase with size and the repair gets a little bit more complicated. Um, but depending on your symptomatology, depending on your time in your life, it's not always the right time to have surgery.